Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. You are welcome to another edition of our online classes. So today we are going to continue from where we stop the other time. And don't forget, uh, we start on the question 13. So today we are starting with the question 14. And yeah, question 14 is still the different shades between the primary cell and secondary cell. Now, we have, don't forget that we have two different types of cells. Primary and then secondary cell. So what does the what the major difference between the two types of cells? So primary cells are cells which produces current as a result of non-reversible chemical changes that occurs within the various component part of the cell. Primary cells are the cells which produces current as a result of non-reversible chemical changes which occurs between the various component part of the cell. Why the secondary cells are cells that can be recharged once the chemical in them is being used up. Secondary cells are the type of cell which produces electricity or current in which its chemical can be recharged once it is being used up. And another difference that uh, uh, we see here uh, between the primary and then the secondary cell is that primary cell is which has, uh, secondary cell is rechargeable while primary cell is not rechargeable. An example of primary cell, as, as you know, are uh, the block and chain cell, that is the torch light batteries. The torch light batteries uh, are immediately what we have as tiger egg batteries. An example of secondary cells are car batteries, car batteries, or motorcycle batteries. So let's go to uh, 14A2. For the you see that explain why eight 1.5 volt dry cells in series cannot start a car, but one 12 volt lead, lead as a accumulator can start it. Don't forget that when we have uh, eight different Lucranchi cells rated 1.5 volts in series, for instance, I have two, three, four, five, six, seven, then eight. So we have it in this manner, in which each of these uh, primary cell is rated 1.5 volts, 1.5 volts, 1.5 volts, 1.5 volts, 1.5 So the last one, which is 1.5 volts. So we have 1.5 volts in eight pieces. Because all these three, all these eight cells are, are rated in series. So to find their effective EMA, that is the total EMA, E total, yeah, effective EMA. So we are going to add all this 1.5 and 8 plate, that is 1.5 multiplied by 8. So this one will still give us 12 volts. Now, the combination of 8 primary cells giving us 12 volts also equals 12 volt one lead as an argument. But why is it that these 8 primary cells cannot start a car? And just only one lead acid accumulator can start a car. First and foremost, all these primary cells, all these cells in series, they are primary cells. That is the first. And this lead acid accumulator is a secondary cell. That is the first thing. The second thing is that the primary cells, as we know, they have high internal resistance, which brings about low amount of current they produce. But the lead acid accumulator have low internal resistance, which brings about high current or high uh, electricity. So the reason why eight one point eight dry cells in city cannot start a car is that they possess or they have high internal resistance. And the reason why only one twelve volt lead acid accumulator can start a car is because it has low internal resistance. So let's quickly go to question three. So a moving coil meter of internal resistance 50 ohms has a full scale deflection of 10 mA. A parallel resistance of 0.05 ohms is connected to the galvanometer. In order to convert it into an ammeter, the full scale deflection of the ammeter is also named the resistance. So we have two questions in one. This question of gravity is just two questions in one. Now, don't forget that we have a galvanometer that we can use to uh, sense or detect very small amount of current. And this galvanometer can be converted or can be adapted in two ways. One, we can adapt this galvanometer to measure high amount of current. That is, we can convert this galvanometer to ammeter. 
And likewise, you are also convert this galvanometer to volt meter, that is to measure high potential difference. But in this case, if we want to uh, convert galvanometer to measure high amount of current, that is, we want to convert galvanometer to high meter. So, in what arrangement do you think we need to convert our galvanometer? Now, to convert our galvanometer to high meter, we need to uh, connect another external resistor in parallel to the galvanometer to convert our galvanometer to ammeter, that is to measure high amount of electric current. So we need to convert or we need to arrange the galvanometer and external resistor in parallel to the galvanometer. But to convert the galvanometer to voltmeter, we need a resistor, external resistor called multiplier and we arrange that multiplier in series with the galvanometer. But in this case now, let's see the arrangement, the, the conversion that I want to carry out. Is it uh, to convert it to ammeter or to convert it to uh, voltmeter? Now, because another resistor, a parallel resistance of 0 0.05 is connected to the galvanometer, which means this galvanometer will, uh, will want to adapt it to measure high amount of current. Then, that's why we need uh, this governor to be converted to be arranged in parallel with external resistor. Now, in this case, the question is now asking us to calculate the full scale deflection of the ammeter and we also name the resistor. Now, let me first clear that second part of the question. Should we should name the resistor. The resistor used here, because we want to convert this governor to ammeter, so the resistor will be shunt. The resistor will be shunt. Now, if we want to convert this galvanometer to voltmeter, so that resistor that we need is called multiplier, and that multiplier will be connected in series with the galvanometer. But because this one is connected in, in, in parallel, so that resistor is called shunt. So let's find the solution to this. In order to uh, easily find the solution to this question, you can just interpret, you can first interpret the question because you said we are having a galvanometer. This is my galvanometer. It's being connected with another external resistor. But this resistor is in parallel. You can see the arrangement. We are having total current here. High total. Now you want this galvanometer to measure. Ordinarily, the galvanometer cannot measure map high value of current. But how can we adapt this galvanometer to measure high value of current? Then we need to we need an external resistor. This external resistor is now called shunt. Called shunt. It has no value of uh, resistor. Then we connect this one, we arrange it in parallel with the galvanometer. But from the question, what are we doing? The moving coil meter of internal resistance 50 ohms, which means the internal resistance of the galvanometer is 50 ohms. 50 ohms. As a full scale deflection of 10 milliampere. So the current that passes through this galvanometer is 10 milliampere. 10 milliampere. Don't forget 10 milliampere is 10 times 10 minus or minus 30 ampere. So it's necessary for you to convert that to ammeter. So it's necessary to convert it to ampere, rather, to convert it to ampere. Then we have a parallel resistance of 0 0.05 ohms. So the resistance of the shunt here is, is 0 0.05 ohms. It's connected to the government in order to convert it into ammeter. The full scale deflection of the ammeter is there. We are now looking for the total current here. The total current that is measured by that government. Now, one thing we need to know is that from here, because this is a junction, by the time this total current is coming and enter this junction, this current is going to divide into two. But the amount of the current that is going to pass through this resistance, this resistor shunt and the galvanometer, depend on the resin of the shunt and the resin of the galvanometer. So in this case, part of this current will pass through the galvanometer, I have it to be IG. And part of the, the remaining part of the current will pass through the shunt, I have it to be IS. But because G and R are in parallel, so in parallel, the same potential difference will pass through them for different current. But in this case, I total will give me I galvanometer plus I S. I total will give me I galvanometer plus I S. And in this case, V total, because they are in parallel, will be equal to V G, will be equal to V S. V total, will be equal to V G, will be equal to V S. Which means, if I know the total current that passes through the 
galvanometer. I know it's other current that pass through the uh, shunt. It will be very easier for me to add it to and find the total current. But if I have been given the value of the current that passes through the galvanometer, but I don't know the current that passes through the, what? the uh, shunt. So I can use my Vx. My Vx equal I from Ohm's law Is times Rs. I know Rs. I don't know Is. I don't know Vs. But I know that if I know the total voltage, then I can easily uh, find the value of my Vs. Why do I know my total voltage? Because they are in parallel. I know that my Vs, my V total, my V total will be equals to. Okay, let me find my Vg. My Vg, which is Ig times Rg. Ig times Rg. What is my Ig? That is the current that passes through the galvanometer. That is 10 milliampere. 10 milli, and that is 10 times 10 to the minus 30 ampere. 10 milli ampere. Multiply by Rg. Rg is 0 0.05 ohms. 0 0.05 ohm. So therefore, I have Vg to be equal to 10 times 10 to the minus 30 times 5 times 10 to the minus 2. If we find the value of this, I will have my Vg to be equal to will be equals to 50 times 10 raised to the power of minus 5 volts. So uh, this is indirectly equal the value of what? V total. Also equal the value of what? Vs. My Vg from this expression, I can call this equation 1, and call this equation 2. From equation 2, I know that V total equal Vg equal Vs. Why is it that V total equal Vg equal Vs? I know that in parallel, in parallel, the same potential difference will pass through the galvanometer and the same potential will pass through the, uh, the shunt. But different current will pass through. That's why I said, because different current will pass through the galvanometer and shunt, that's why I said I totally give me the addition of the current A and the current A. But the same potential difference, that's why we have this. And for me to have calculated for VG, directly or indirectly, I've already calculated for V total and Vn. So I can now come back here now. I can come back here. Where I have Vs equal Is dot Rs. What am I looking for? I'm looking for, I'm looking for, okay, the total current. So to find the total current, I will find Is. My Is will be Vs over Rs. So in this case, my Vs is 50 times 10 raised to the power of minus 5 divided by Rs. Rs is 0 .0 0 0.05. 0 0.05. 0 0.05. Oh, please, sorry. Sorry, please. My Vg equal Ig Rg. And Rg, the resistance of the galvanometer is 50 ohms. Not 0 0.05, 50 ohms. I'm sorry for that. My RG is 50 ohms. So I have 50 times this, that is 500. That is 500 times 10 raised to the power of minus 3. That is 500 times 10 and minus 3. So I will have the same thing here 50, that is 500 times 10 and minus 3 divided by 0 0.05. So from here, using indices, I will have 500 times 10 to the minus 3 divided by 5 times 10 to the minus 2. So in this case, I want to find my Is. I want to find my Is. In this case, I want to find my Is. So my Is will be, my Is will be, will be, so that is 5 in 500, that is 100, multiplied by minus 3. If you bring this minus 2 up, oh, that's minus 3 plus 2, and that is minus 1. So I will have 100 times 10 to the minus 1, and that's something as 10. That's something as 10 milliampere. That is 10 milliampere. That is 10 milliampere. That is 10 milliampere. 
So in this case, in this case, I will now have my I total. I will have my I total. I will have my I total to be equal to Ig plus Is. Ig plus Is. What is my Ig? Ig is 10 milliampere. Is is also 10 milliampere. So in this case, I have 20 milliampere. In this case, I have 20 milliampere. So the current, the current, the total current is 20 milliampere. And the name of the resistor is shunt. The name of the resistor is shunt because the resistor connected in parallel to the galvanometer in order to convert it to ammeter is shown. But if you want to convert the galvanometer to uh, voltmeter, we need a resistor called multiplier, and that multiplier will be connected in series with the galvanometer. In series with the galvanometer. In series with the galvanometer. With the galvanometer. So in this case, in this case, so let's go to let's go to B. That is 14B. Let's go to 14B. Let's go to 14B. Let's go to 14B. Let's go to 14B. So 14B says that briefly explain with the aid of a diagram how a concave mirror can be used to briefly explain. Briefly explain how a concave mirror can be used can be used to Roman one can be used Roman one ignite ignite a piece of carbon paper, a piece of carbon paper. So, uh, briefly explain with the aid, sorry, briefly explain with the, with the aid of a diagram, with the aid of a diagram, how a concave mirror can be used to, one, ignite a piece of paper, a carbon paper, I have a but let me play, give solution to Mavigo 1. Now, for a carbon paper to be ignited using a concave mirror, it means therefore that that carbon paper must have been placed at a uh, certain distance to the uh, concave mirror. And at what distance can we place the carbon paper in order for that carbon paper to work to be ignited by a concave mirror? Don't forget that uh, when a ray or different rays are coming from infinity, and striking the concave surface, concave mirror surface, what happens, all these rays are going to be reflected and pass through a common point. This common point is what we call the principal focus. So at the point where we play the carbon paper, at the principal focus of a concave mirror, so that carbon paper will, work, will be ignited. That's the only point where the carbon paper can be placed as so as to uh, be ignited by a concave mirror. So with the head of a diagram, what you just have is that you draw the concave mirror, then you draw the principal, the principal axis, the imaginary line. So don't forget here, you are going to have the uh, principal focus, which is F. I have the center of curvature of the mirror, then I have the put A. So now this is the reflecting surface of the concave mirror, and then this is the C far side of the so for any ray coming from infinity, we have this, we have this now. The arrow is very, very important. So this tells us that the arrow is coming from infinity. So this ray is going to be reflected in the manner that is going to pass through the principal focus. So if we now have the carbon paper at this side, let's say we have the carbon, this is the carbon paper. Carbon paper at the principal focus. So this ray again, by that it reflects, is going to pass through the principal focus. 
Now, yeah, that's when we see that some other rays below the principal axis through at this point. So they are still going to reflect, passing through the principal focus, passing through the principal focus. And in this case, in this case, the carbon paper placed at the principal focus of this mirror will be uh, we get uh, ignited. So that is that for Roman figure one. So the carbon paper can be ignited when it's being placed at the principal focus of a concave mirror. So this is the link. Rays from infinity. Infinity. So Roman figure two. Roman figure two. Roman figure two. Now, at what point can we place an object so as to produce, so that a concave mirror will produce exact copy of a picture on a screen? To produce exact copy of a picture on a screen. Now, a concave mirror or converging lens can produce exact image of an object on the screen, provided that that object is placed at, at the center of curvature. Provided the object is placed at the center of curvature of the mirror. Roman we got two. Roman we got two. For concave mirror to produce, Exact, exact copy or exact image, exact copy of objects on on a screen. In this case, I have a concave mirror because concave mirror is an example of curved mirror, so it was somehow curved a little bit. Then you draw your principal axis. Then we have pool A. You draw your, you locate your principal focus. You locate your center of coverage, which is C. But don't forget, when you are drawing this, you need to make use of these three rules that we have for uh, image to be produced by concave mirror or convex mirror. So don't forget those three rules. Now, we are going to use those three rules to produce the image of this object placed at the center of coverage. The object is going to be placed at the center of coverture. This is the object. But before we go into that, uh, those uh, three rules, for you to locate your principal focus and center of coverture, you need to take note of one thing. Your C equals 2F, or your F equals C over 2, which means that if the distance of your F from the pole is 2 centimeters, then your C from the pole is going to be what? 4 cm from the pole. If the distance between F and pole is 3 cm, the distance of this center of curvature of this concave mirror to the pole is going to be 6 cm. So you must make sure you draw to scale. You draw to scale. You don't just use free and scale. If you use free and scale, you won't get the correct answer. So you need to measure of your ruler and your pencil. Now, in this case, once we've located, the principal focus of our concave mirror, our center of curvature, which is C. Then we measure any any convenient length or height of the object, any convenient height of the object. So we place our object at the center of curvature, which is C. Then the first rule says that the first rule says that a ray coming from the object, a ray coming from the object, parallel and close to the principal axis. We pass through the principal focus after reflection. A ray coming from the object, parallel and close to the principal axis. We pass through the principal focus after reflection. So we have the first rule. The fir that first rule produces this way and this way. This is rule one. The second rule states that a ray from the object coming from the object, passing through the principal focus. The ray from the object passing through the principal focus in this manner will reflect parallel and close to the principal axis. We reflect parallel and close to the principal axis. So in this case, I'm going to have, I'm going to have, I'm going to have this. In this case, I'm going to have this. Don't mind it because I'm using a phi and the air. So you, if you are using ruler, you must get the exact value, exact value. So you have the 
arrow in this direction, and we have the arrow in here, the arrow in here. Then this is rule two. This is rule two. Now, not all the time we'll be using those three rules. At times, our two rules, the first two rules can give us the position of the image. As you can see, the point of intersection, we have the point of intersection between rule one and rule two. Rule one, this is the ray produced by rule one, which is the, this is the rule two. The ray produced by rule two is it. They, are, we, they intersect at a point. We have the intersect, we have, that's the position of the image. Then we have our image in this form. Our image is in this form. Because how do we know that? You can leave this arrow. This one pointed downwards. Why this one pointed for all day? This one pointed upward. How do we know how, whether our arrow is going to point downward or upward? Any image, any object placed above the principal axis, this is the principal axis. Any image placed above the principal axis. This is the principal axis. Any image placed above the principal axis will be upright and the arrow is going to point upward. And any object or image below the principal axis will be inverted. Because it's an inverted image or object, so the arrow is going to point downward. So for this, the arrow is pointing out because it's an inverted image. And you can see the point of intersection of these two rays produce image, which is also formed at the exact position where the, our object is located. So for concave mirror to produce exact copy of an object, the object must have been placed at a point not below or beyond the principal, sorry, the center of cover. That is, the object must be located at the principal. Sorry, no. the object must be located at the center of cover. The object must be located at the center of cover. That's the only condition for the concave mirror to have produced the exact copy of an object. So, in this case, the object, the object will be on center of curvature. The object will be on center of curvature. And the nature of the image, even though the question did not ask you to say the nature of the image, but the nature of the image, the nature of the image is that the image is inverted, the image is going to be of the same height as the object. The image is going to be of the same distance from the mirror as the object. So that is that for Roman, for Roman figure 2. Now, Roman figure 3 now. That is B, B3. Roman figure 3, B3. An object is placed 20, an object. Is placed. An object is placed. Twenty centimeter from a confiding lens of focal length twelve centimeter. If a real image if a real image of height 6 cm is formed the distance of the image the distance of the image to the lens and height of the object respectively are respectively are so let's look at this under lens so don't forget we have two types of lenses even though they are more than two, but two main types of lenses. We have the convex lens and then we have the converging lens. The convex lens is also called the converging. The convex lens. 
It's also called the converging lens. Why the diverging lens is called the concave lens? The diverging lens is called the concave lens. So, but this person is under convex or converging lens. Now, from the question, we try to write out what you are given. Solution. What are you given in that expression? You are given the, an object is placed 20 centimeters from a confiding lens. So that is object distance u 20 centimeters. 20 centimeters. Or focal length, 12 centimeters. The focal length of the lens, f, is 12 centimeters. If a real image of height 6 cm is formed, that is the height of the object H0 is 6 cm. The distance of the image to the lens and height of the object respectively are if a real image of height, sorry, this one is H I, image height is 6 cm. Then we are looking for the distance of the image V unknown. We are still looking for the height of the object, that is H0, unknown. Now, to calculate my V, the first one, let me say alpha, image distance, V. I will use lens formula, which is 1 over F, equal 1 over U, plus 1 over V. Because it's a real image, so you are going to use plus A. But if it's a virtual image, so you use minus 1 over V. And if it's a diverging lens, our area is going to be positive is what? Minus 1 over V. So I'm using positive here because I'm dealing with converging lens. Now in this case, let's make our V the sorry for. So 1 over V will be 1 over F minus 1 over U. So in this case, we have 1 over 12 minus 1 over 20. So my V here, if you find the LCM and then you solve it, my V is going to be 30.3 centimeters. My V is going to be 30.3 centimeters. And the object height from the definition of magnification, I have, that is, let me say beta now, beta object height, H0. To find H0, I will use magnification equal V over U, which equal HI over H0. So from here, I will substitute, I will substitute. I've calculated for my V. I know my U. H I has been given. Then we try to make our H not obvious this and the solar formula. So in this case, in this case we have, in this case we have H not equal. H I times U divided by V. And this something as my H I is 6 times U, which is 20, divided by V, which is 30.3. My H naught will be, my H naught will be 3.96, 3.96 centimeter, 3.96 centimeter. So question C1, question 14 C1. The question says that draw, Draw a simple, a simple diagram, a simple diagram of a step, step up transformer, step up transformer. Don't forget that we have two types of transformer. We have step up transformer and then we have step down transformer. What do we have between the two? Step up transformer is just a uh, transformer which are in which is number of turns for the pre, for the secondary terminal is more than the number of turns of wire in the primary terminal. But for step down transformer, the number of turns at the primary terminal is more than the number of turns of wire at the secondary terminal. So in this case, so we have in this case we have we have. This is I have. And this is I have. So you got a step up. The number of now I can 
assume that this is my primary terminal. That is the input terminal. Input terminal. So primary. This is my primary terminal. At times I can call it input. Input terminal. So my secondary terminal now we have so this is secondary terminal secondary or output output terminal you can see that the number of terms at the primary is less than that of the secondary. So in this case, the voltage produced at the secondary terminal or at the output terminal will be more than the voltage produced at the primary. So in this case, we have step power transformer. Now, last, the last question, which is C2. C2. The question asks you to find or stay true with the real energy is lost in the transformer. We have different ways that real energy can be lost in the transformer. One, we have the eddy current loss. Two, we have the hysteresis loss. We have three, we have the power of I square R loss. I have one, the eddy current loss. Two, I have the hysteresis loss. Then three, I have the heat or I square R loss. It or I square. So these are the ways in which energy can be lost in the transformer. And uh, this is the end of uh, question 14. So our next class, we are going to treat the last part of our SAC mock examination, which is question 15. Here, we are going to stop on question 14 today. The next time I come here, I still remain your Malam Salakon.